Dr. Demartini, welcome to Ayurvedic Healing and Beyond podcast. It's, it's a real honor to have you. Thank you for having me. I was looking forward to it. Four years ago, when I wanted to start my podcast, you know, I was doing a, a course on how to start a podcast and the mentor who was guiding me told me, you need to make a list of all the guests that you would like to have it in your podcast. And one of the person that I did write at that time, four years ago, was your name. And uh, it's, a, it's a fan moment right now to have you in the podcast. So it's a real honor. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Dr. Demartini, you know, one of the works that I, I personally have uh, gotten a lot of benefit is you talk a lot about how important are your value systems in life. Now, this impacts, you know, some people I know when I, when I tell them, oh, you need to go to the gym, but no, I don't have time, but they do have time for other things, like how values determine their action process. Now, the question, where are these values formed? I mean, is it something like a genetics or is it because of the people who are surrounding us? How do we actually create these value systems? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, there are a number of impacts. The first one is multi-generational epigenetics. Grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents go through situations in their life that they are either seeking or avoiding, that they perceive as pleasure or pain, that could be forms of distress. Because we have stress is the perception of loss of something we seek or the perception of gain of something we try to avoid. Those stresses affect the autonomic nervous system, which affects the epigenetic second messenger coding system, which leave an imprint and tags on our genetics and our histones, DNA and histones. And those are carried over multi-generationally through these epigenetic tags. So we can have some of those impulses and instincts from multi-generational. Then we can also, during gestation, now that we know that we're not blank slates from born, we're picking up information in early stages even, we can accumulate perceptions of seek and avoid autonomic stimuli. They can also add to this. And then from the day we're born, all the way to where we are in our age at the current moment, we're accumulating things we seek and avoid that affect our autonomics. Anything that supports our values activates the parasympathetic. Anything that challenges our values activates the sympathetic. And these create a acetylation or a methylation on the histones and DNA and various portions of the cell inside the cell and lead to expressions that affect our life and anything that we perceive as either supportive or challenge that we like or dislike that we evaluate and judge is affecting our our evaluations and values so our values are a byproduct of multi-generational gestational and post-birth postpartum um, perceptions that we have as an individual now what are these perceptions and what are these voids and values because what we perceive as missing becomes important. So let's say we meet somebody and we admire them and look up to them and we minimize ourselves to them. And we're conscious of their positives and unconscious of their negatives, but we minimize ourselves to them and become unconscious of our positives and conscious of our negatives. So we're putting them on a pedestal, we're minimizing us and we're too humble to admit what we see in them and inside us. And that, Minimization of self creates a void that wants to be fulfilled, to level the playing field, to have a balanced relationship with somebody. Because we can't, if we put somebody on pedestals or put somebody in pits, we judge them. When we put them in equilibrium, we love them. And we're yearning for homeostasis, equanimity, and judge and love, not judgment. Now, if we put people in the pit and exaggerate ourselves and are now too proud to admit what we see in them, we now have a void. And so anything we're too proud or too humble to admit what we see in other things around us, people around us, we create voids that leaves us empty that want to be fulfilled so we can return to love and bring homeostasis. It's a homeostatic mechanism inside our brain. And we have literally mechanisms inside the brain to bring us back to homeostasis. So these voids 
which are a result of these judgments, which are perceptions that we picked up or picked up from multi-generation, are leaving these voids inside us that we want to fill. And they, the things we're too proud or too humble to admit. And they all are impacting our value decisions. In other words, if we've picked up, if we've been around somebody that's very, very challenging there and we resent them and we go, that's pain, we're going to want to avoid that and seek its opposite. If we see something that's very pleasurable, parasympathetic, we're going to seek that and avoid its opposite. So anything we seek or avoid that we judge is creating voids and emptiness. That's why you can't feel fulfilled judging people. You only feel fulfilled when you love and appreciate people. And those are creating voids that are stored in our amygdala and hippocampus. And they're creating a, an emptiness inside us that we want to fill. So that's the source of our values. And our values are accumulating and modifying and molding as we go through life, as we have different experiences. And we can just passively be the byproduct of all these experiences, or we can consciously uh, stack up new associations and change our voids and values, change our, our priorities. We make decisions uh, based on whatever we believe will give us the greatest advantage or disadvantage at any moment. So if I stack up the benefits of something and keep stacking up benefits and find the benefits of something, we increase the probability of doing it by Skinner's operant conditioning. If we stack up the draw, we decrease the probability of doing it. So as we go through life, if we see something painful and that's a sympathetic response or something pleasurable, we're modifying our values and filling up. We're now voids that we now want to fill. So we can change those consciously and I can stack up the associations and increase the probability of people doing things. Um, I'll give you an example, a real case example, a funny example. I was in uh, Sydney, Australia, teaching a breakthrough experience, one of my signature programs. And there was a lovely lady that came in early and was sitting in the front row. And I walked in and put my bag of materials up and was getting ready to get my microphones on for the program. And she said, oh, Dr. DiMartin, I finally got to your breakthrough experience. I've been wanting to come for the last couple of years. I finally came and I'm, I want you to help me find my soulmate. And that's not uncommon for a single woman. She wants to find some partner. And there was another guy in the room that was munching on a breakfast mac, just really grossly eating food. And he was not the most handsome looking guy. He was kind of dressed down, et cetera. So I played a trick on her and just for fun, just to be a mischievous. And I said, what about this guy? And she looked over her shoulder at the guy like that and goes, Oh, God, no, Dr. DiMartino. Oh, no, no, that's definitely not my type. I said, seriously? Do you know who this guy is? And she said, no. I said, you don't recognize him? No, should I? I said, I'm surprised you don't recognize him. He's one of the wealthiest billionaires in the world. Really? Yeah. We've let him in because he's incognito. He's dressing down. He's trying to make himself not be seen, but he's known around the world. And uh, yeah, he's a single man. Uh, he's he hangs out with the A-list celebrities, prime ministers, presidents, you know, anybody that's anybody, they know him. He's a philanthropist. He's got yachts and homes and planes. I mean, he's just a very amazing guy. And he used to uh, date Michelle Pfeiffer. And, and you know, and, and I just and I built this story up about this guy based on what typically makes a girl enticed. Right. Mm -hmm. And Heather going and. And at the end of my little presentation, she said, well, aren't you going to at least introduce me to him? <laughs> so I, I changed her perception of the advantages over disadvantages of this guy, even though her first impression was, oh, no. When I was done, she wanted his, his contact. She wanted to meet him. So that's called st stacking up associations and making new associations in the brain, just like a Pavlovian dog salivating when you put a, a bell, you know. You put food next to it, you put a bell, it rings a bell and you salivate. So you can take associations and you can rearrange the perceptions that create the voids that then determine values. And I do this regularly for people that have never been able to make money and save money and build wealth. I can stack up new associations where now they're all of a sudden, you know, deferring gratification, increasing their income and now building wealth. So I can, I can make it where they have had difficulties finding relationships and stack up associations and make them now all of a sudden be more like a, a chick magnet or a guy magnet. 
So it's it's all the associations we've made. And instead of waiting for things to randomly occur, uh, we can go through and consciously make those associations and change the voids and therefore the values. And um, it's simply perceptions. And uh, if I go in there and ask the right question, which I've learned to do, I know how to change those and move them up or down and raise it or lower values. When you're a mother and you've been raising kids for say 20 years and they finally go off to college and you're kind of go, well, whoa, my identity, what is my identity now? You know, if all of a sudden she's, she doesn't have kids to work with. So she has spontaneous changes that's important to her. And then she starts adapting and thinks, well, maybe I want to, you know, open up a business or I may want to do something different now. So life is constantly tweaking the values, but you can do it consciously. And so I'm, that's the quality of your life is basically quite the questions you ask. If you ask questions that create voids or reduce voids, you can make a difference in where you're going and the priorities you make in life. So, doctor, so let's say that, you know, I ended up having a certain value system and I really deep, most people go on an autopilot unconsciously. They don't know what their value systems are. They just go on. And let's say somebody who has a value system that work, fun, these are the top value systems. Maybe I want to work and I want to have financial wealth and maybe fun is very important to me. And let's say they keep health as the least priority. How can we tell them what, what methods can we do? Maybe it's time that you put health as your number one values or your priorities. If that is... That won't do anything. That won't do anything. You can tell them, that, you know, time to put that as a priority. Then that's not going to do it. But what can if we... Their do? Highest value, the, if their highest value is business and wealth, mm -hmm. if that's truly what it is, their life demonstrates, not what they say. Mm -hmm. If you ask people what their values are, they'll tell you all kinds of lies. They don't even know. They'll tell you what they think it should be. I don't pay attention to what people say. I go by what they live, hmm. what their life demonstrates, because every decision is based on their values. So I, I can tell by how they live their life what's priority. The choices they make in 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 because people have a high value on wealth building, for instance, they defer gratification, they take money that's that's you know that they make and they put it into asset accumulation. And people that don't, they buy other things and they never get around to being able to afford to buy assets. So their life demonstrates what their value is. But if I want to change the values to health or raise health on the values, I have to ask them a question and we have to make a new association in the brain. How specifically is doing healthy actions going to help you build wealth? If hmm. they can't see it, they're not going to do it. But if all of a sudden I, I go online and I go, uh, what is the health routine of the wealthiest people on the planet? And I, I find the top 10 wealthiest people and I find what their health routine, their exercise routine, their diet routine. And I discover what it is. And I, and then I go up to them and I said, you know, it's interesting. I was reading an article. I know you're really, you know, you're building your wealth and everything else. That's what's important to you. I found this article on the wealthiest people and what they do to get their wealth on exercise and nutrition or health or how they eat. I just thought you'd enjoy that. What you just did is you just now made a new association. If I do these things, I increase my wealth. Because if wealth is important, I just made an association with wealth by doing these things. If I just tell them you need to do that, that's a projection of your values and you think wealth is important. I mean, health, uh, health is important. If I go and I also say, I looked up the dictionary and I found out that if you look up the etymology of wealth, it takes you to the word wheel, which means wellness and well-being. And if you look up health, it takes you to the same root, which is wheel, which means health and well-being. Isn't it interesting? The healthier we are, the wealthier we become. And I made two links now in their brain. And if I go in and I said, if all of a sudden you've got all the money in the world, have you ever, and we go and make a list of the people that had cancer, billionaires that had cancer and destroyed their, their health and didn't get to enjoy their money, I can I bring that article to them and I can say, you know, this is what happens if we don't take care of our health. All the money in the world is not going to do anything. And we start making associations on the pains of not taking care of health and the pleasures of taking health in relationship to wealth or business development, or whatever's highest on their value, family. If their highest value is family, then I link it to that. And I find associations that are not necessarily coming from me,
but I ask them questions or I show them lit articles or whatever that show the relationship. Once I make new associations, they think, hmm. Like I had a guy that said he wanted to build his business to make more money. And I and I and I said, but you need an exercise program. <clears throat> and so what's your what exercise do you do? Well, occasionally I go golfing. Okay. So I went over there and I found out some of the wealthiest people again and some of the, the most powerful businessmen. How many golf? And I said, how many deals? I went and found an article and how many deals go down on the golf course? How many multi-billion dollar deals are on the golf course? And I started associating. If I exercise and I go golfing three times a week, I'm going to increase my business and make more money. And I'm now linked it. So you can take and make associations and stack up associations with Almost anything to anything. There's no lack of, you know, we can turn any association, anything can be linked to anything if you know what to ask the right question or bring the right information. So we can stack up enough associations on it where all of a sudden health becomes extremely valuable in their life. I think when you're- This is now associated with what's important. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I was just thinking about one of the analogies, the stories about a person who quit the, who quit smoking immediately. So there was a, uh, he couldn't quit smoking at all. And he was a chronic smoker. And one fine day, his little girl comes up and tell him, Daddy, when I grow up and when I get married, I want you to be there with me. And that's, that's just one single incident that helped him to quit smoking. So somewhere that value that yeah. thing was important. That's it, because now he valued the child. Exactly. And because he valued the child, he realized he's already aware that it's affecting his health. Mm -hmm. And then he thought, wow. If I, if I let her down, I'll be letting down my daughter if I keep doing this. Yep, that's a pain association, but you can use pain to stop or pleasure to begin. It's a basically an association in the brain. Mm. It's an amygdala response. And yeah, that's a classic example. I had a, a situation where somebody ended up having a really close friend who was smoking. They were two guys that smoked. The guy mm -hmm. was that was his close friend 59 years old lung cancer and died scared the hell out of him and that that was enough of association to make him said i'm 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 gonna walk so he says i'm stopping smoking i'm going for a walk i'm cleaning out my lungs because hmm. i can't believe it. i i thought the guy was gonna live another 20 years at least he didn't it scared him and he felt that because he smoked with him he kept it going he felt guilty and he actually felt like he he wanted to take care of that family that now is burdened without the husband. So he was basically realizing that, you know, he feels like he's, he owes his family and their family to continue and make sure he doesn't do that because they didn't expect that guy to die so quick. That can show that can shatter somebody's and change it. You can, you had two ways of changing values, small incremental tweaks, which is called the gradual hypothesis or cataclysmic punctate changes, drastic changes, that can cause it to change. So we can have a, a, a drastic thing like uh, all of a sudden we're drinking and we end up almost killing our family. That mm -hmm. can make a change that I'm stopping drinking or little incremental changes. Most people have more self-governance and do more priority actions when they're filling their day with their highest priorities. That's why anytime you link anything to the highest priorities, you increase the probability of doing it because we spontaneously act in our highest values. So if, if all of a sudden we're doing something high in our values, our amygdala shuts off and our executive center comes in, which governs our amygdala, and our executive medial prefrontal cortex calms down these impulses and instincts that are usually habits that are not wise to do health-wise. And you're more likely to take, you're more likely not to eat, live to eat. You're more likely to live to eat. I mean, eat to live instead of live to eat. You're more likely to be thinking about, is that really priority to me, overeating? Or is that really priority to me? Overspending. You start thinking longer term when you've lived by your highest priorities. Doctor, if, if let's say, let's imagine my highest priority is I want to have fun. Then it is going to conflict with many other things. Like I'm going to spend money. I'm going to, uh, maybe my health is going to go for a toss. I'm going to indulge in, in consumptions. But I don't know if that is the fun that I'm talking about. But when I have a, priority values that I just want to have entertainment and fun or adventure, then how do we turn around that? Like, 
uh, should we maybe you know sh- i'm just asking myself maybe i should think that if i want to have more fun i need to have health and i need to have wealth only then i can have fun is that the way i have to reassociate the fun element well i've been doing value determinations for since 1978 mm-hmm. so that's a bit pretty 46 years i think that's a, a and, lot of uh, we've got yeah i've been doing values of hundreds of thousands of people i haven't seen fun ever show up on the top mm-hmm. not one so when somebody says that fun is their highest value i don't buy it mm-hmm. it's using escape because they're not fulfilling what's high that's usually the case now adventure i've seen um yeah i've definitely seen adventure they want to travel the world they want to go and climb mountains they want to do things of this nature i've seen that but just having fun is usually an escape of an unfulfilled life just to to escape and have pleasure when you're doing something that's meaningful i don't usually call it's not called fun it's called what inspires you Mm -hmm. It's not an escape. When, when you're doing something that's really, really, really priority in your life and really important in your life, uh, it's inspiring. And you love doing it. But you're not dedicated just for pleasure. It's not a hedonistic pursuit. Hedonism, there's a difference. As Aristotle said there's hedonistic and eudaimonia. And mm-hmm. eudaimonia is well, wellness. And, and, and the hedonistic system is non-sustainable. People that want to try to get a quick fix on pleasure, it's non-sustainable. We have a hedonic adaptation and treadmill system that automatically calms it back down. So you can't sustain it. So people are searching for pleasure. Searching pleasure will be futile. That's why drug addictions show up because they're looking for high. They can't sustain it. So they have to take more drugs to get the same high. But people that are doing something really important and really meaningful, I don't find them looking for hedonistic pursuits. I don't, I don't find them doing something that's just purely pleasure oriented. I find them having inspiration, doing what they love doing. You know, Warren Buffett reads throughout the day. You know, his love is investments and studying and learning. And he loves that. He doesn't need to escape with, with a, a, just to go and have fun and escape. So I always say when you're filling your day with high priority actions, you do something meaningful. When you're not, you feel you need to compensate for that by an escape. And, uh, and money without meaning leads to debauchery. Money mm-hmm. with meaning leads to philanthropy. So when people, I had a gentleman who was from France, who had a net worth of about $750 million. He had a big company. He sold the company. He still had some shares in it, but, but he was basically hosting. He had no more purpose, no more meaning, nothing that was valuable. Just And he was just drinking and drinking and drinking and just getting sloshed all day long. I mean, he was knocking out 20, 30 drinks a day and just killing himself. And so everybody was trying to get him on a, you know, a 12-step program or a you know, Betty Ford clinic or who knows what they were trying to do. All I did is I said, your drinking accelerated when you stopped working, didn't it? He goes, yeah, I've just gone over the, over the edge. I said, why, why stop working? What the hell are you doing? You got a genius mind. You got business savvy. Get back in the game and start doing some deals. Put yourself in the game. Why'd you retire? If you love doing it, why'd you stop? I just thought that that's what you do at a certain age. I said, you don't, there were certain things in your business you didn't love doing. Don't do that. Go do deals. Go back to the company. Tell them, I'd like to just do deals and give them a percentage of it. Take a little out of it and add it to the shares or purchase more shares or something. So he went back to work. And because he had a deal that he set up, he didn't want to be sloshed when he went to do the deal. And the second he had something that was higher in priority, that was deeply important and meaningful, that was fulfilling to him, his drinking went down about 10% of what it was. And the second he stopped doing his, his, his deals, his drinking went up to insane levels. So if we fill our day with high priority actions that inspire us and activate the medial prefrontal cortex, which governs the amygdala, we're less likely to do impulsive reactions or do the things that actually undermine health and well-being. So I don't find typically that pleasure ever shows up on the value list. I find that people that are pleasure seeking, you're usually compensating for not prioritizing their life and not filling their day with something deeply meaningful. They love what they do. Their pleasure is already fulfilled. They're already fulfilled in their life doing what they love. 
They don't need to go pleasure seeking. When you say this, um, I, it just reminds me of one of the documentaries of Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, in that he's during the seventies when he was going to for the Mister Olympia. He said, "When I lift weights, and and when I feel pumped up, it feels like I'm at my highest sensual pleasures that I can ever have. I don't think I need anything else." So that yeah. is, was the biggest. Yeah, he loves it. Exactly. So yeah. I, when you do something deeply meaningful, the amygdala doesn't distract you for immediate gratification. So, Dr. D. Martini, where do people get into the trap of burnout? Then? You know, people say, no, I love this work, but then I got burnt out. So where do you think they missed out something? No, no. I've never seen that to be true. We can work 18. I, I, I can easily do 20 hours a day. I did for 35 years. I did 20 hours a day. No problem. You don't get burned out doing something you love. No way. You get burned out like if somebody would say, well, I love business. No, you don't. You mm. know, you love portions of the business. See, I love it. In my business, I'm involved in education. So I teach, I research, I write, and I travel. That's it. Everything else is delegated. If I had to do everything in my business, administration, marketing, you know, financials, bank reconciliations, or who knows what. If I had to do any of those things, I wouldn't be inspired. I wouldn't have the energy. I'd be burned out. You don't get burned out doing something you're inspired to do. You get burned out doing the things that are ancillary to it that come along with it that you haven't learned to delegate. So burnout is doing something that you get challenged by that doesn't inspire you. But if you go and pursue challenges that inspire you, you create eustress, which helps your wellness, not distress, which injures it. It's when you're basically looking for pleasure in your amygdala and trying to avoid pain. And then when the pains come, it's called distress. That's what burns you out. The constant avoidance of things you don't want to have to do that you frustratingly have to do because you haven't learned to delegate it or prioritize it and get on with it. Either go do what you love through delegating or love what you do through linking how doing this activity is helping me fulfill what I value most. Once you do that, you don't get burned out. Mm -hmm. I know people that do I know many people that are working extreme hours. They don't get burned out when they're doing something they're absolutely inspired by. Whenever you feel you're not, you know, able to be productive, when you, whenever you feel you're not at home where you're working, when you feel that I'm not being able to be happy with myself. So somewhere you are having a real conflict with your values. That's where it all comes down to. You're trying to live by somebody else's injected values. Yes. You, you're any the way you know it's happening is they go i really should be doing this i ought to be doing this i need to be doing this i wish i could do this and they keep having a conflict between their values you don't have conflicts in your own hierarchy of values you have conflicts between your values and those that you've injected in and anytime you envy somebody and look up to them and you you put them on a pedestal you're going to inject values hmm. if you walk in a mall and you see somebody you think they're more intelligent than you you're going to put them on a pedestal. You're going to inject whatever you think they do. Anytime you see something you think is more successful, you're going to inject values. As long as we keep comparing ourselves to other people, we're going to inject values and cloud the clarity of what's really important to us, where our, our vitality and energy is at its peak and going to weigh ourselves down with trying to be somebody we're not. And that's your design. You are perfectly designed and it's essential to burn out trying to be somebody you're not. You need burnout there. Because you're going in a direction that's not authentic. But the second you get back on authenticity and you delegate lower party things and, and say no to things that aren't really truly important to you, your energy goes up and your bur the burnout's gone. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen people that claim they have burnout. We prioritize a life that the burnout's gone the next day. It's, it's because they're, not, they're doing something that they don't really get a result. They're not fulfilled in. They don't want to do that. And that's, that'll burn you out. Just like boring. Boring is when you're doing something that doesn't challenge you. Burnout is when you're doing something that over challenges you. You need a balance of those to maximize your potential. So, Dr. DiMartini, let's imagine that I, I am, I'm having a burnout, and I ended up I'm in, a, I'm in a work situation where I didn't like what is happening, but and I was overworking hard, and then I had a burnout. Now I realize, oh my God, my value systems are completely against what I'm working for. Now, that is going to create a lot of stress to come no, back. No, no, no. Let, let, let's, let's change that. Instead of your value systems are against what you're working for, no. 
you don't have wrong value systems. You're setting goals that don't match your value systems. Mm. And what you think is important isn't important. And that's where the challenge is. That's where most of the challenge is. You can change your values, no problem. But most people, I don't find you to change in values that they just need to stop injecting the values of others and setting up false expectations on themselves. That's what most of the problem is. You know, when somebody says, I, I look at their values and I find wealth building is not at the top. It's mm -hmm. number seven or six. And then they say, I want to be financially independent. And they keep trying to do things and then they keep not doing it. They keep prostrating themselves. It's because they're trying to be somebody they're not. They're, they live in the fantasy, I want to be financially independent, but they don't have the values that will lead them to that outcome. Only 1% make it to financial independence. The rest of the people live in fantasies about how they're going to be. And that fantasy and that attempt to live in somebody else's values is what burns them out, not, not their true actions. But once I know that my value system, I'm not living to my value systems. And if I have to live to my value systems in this current world, I, I need to I might have a U-turn. Maybe I might have to quit the job, change the cities, or even say goodbye to my partnership. Because these things do happen when they realize they are in a burnout. What sometimes, could... sometimes that's the wisest thing to do. Yeah. Sometimes people get married because their dad and mom told them they need to be married to that person. Mm -hmm. You know, in India, you face that. In India, your parents are sometimes telling you, here's who you marry. And here's what you're going to do as a career. And that may sometimes work. No doubt. Because sometimes they know you better than you know yourself. But I can't say that's always the case. Because I've certainly seen it. I was just in India the other day, in Chennai. And I, I saw a man and a woman that they got married. And they, they, they go, well, we didn't want to get married. But our parents told us, who this is who we're going to marry. And they're having to adjust to that. So I said, well, okay, you can adjust. You can link values. You can make it. You, there's ways of making it work. But. They had conflict in terms because what their real heart was and what they were told to do are two different things. And many people, particularly in some cultures, subordinate to outer authorities. They subordinate to mommy, to daddy, to preacher, to teacher, to gurus, to societies, to, to communities. And they're, so they're, 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 what they really want to do is this, but I, I, I should do this. I got to do this. I have to do this. I can't do that. What would people think? And they have the fear of rejection. They have the fear of not being smart enough because they're comparing themselves to somebody that they think is smarter. They fear they're going to fail because they're comparing themselves to somebody they think's got more success. They, have, they fear they're going to not make money or going to lose money because they compare themselves to somebody who's got more money. They fear that they're going to lose loved ones and not respect of loved ones because they're comparing themselves to this fantasy family that looks like they are together and peaceful when they're not behind the scenes. They compare themselves to people they think have something they don't and then beat themselves up and then try to live in other people's values. They're still going to live by their own values, but they are tempting to live by somebody else's. That's what burns them out. And they're designed to burn out. Burnout's not a bad thing. Boredom's not a bad thing. It's a feedback mechanism to get you to be authentic. So analyzing this and having awareness, it helps you a lot of to create what is your next best decision to do. And it helps you to give clarity in your life. I can say yes and no so easily. That's the key. That's why I understand the hierarchy of your values. Your hierarchy of values dictate your destiny. And if you don't know what they are and you're subordinating to other people, anytime you look down on somebody and try to get them to live in your values, anytime you look up to somebody and try to live in their values, you're going to end up with futility and you're going to create burnout and boredom and frustration. And those are all feedback mechanisms to let you know that you're not being authentic. You don't get bored or burned out doing something that's authentically inspiring to you. I've been doing teaching 52 years. This is 52nd year. I don't get burned out on it. I have intense schedules. This is, I've already done 100 and, let's see, 117 presentations this year alone. And that's not, pod, that's not podcast, that's just seminar presentations. And I've done tons of podcasts. This is the third podcast today. I, 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 I'm, I do that every day. I don't get burned out. I think you get more energized by doing it. <laughs> I, I love it. You know, I was with a, a, a famous, a famous uh, pianist about a year ago, April last year. And uh, he started playing the piano at three years old. By the time he was nine, he was doing concert piano around the world. 
He was a prodigy. Mm -hmm. They couldn't understand how he was able to do this. He's now 81. I met with him when he was 80. 77 years of practicing the piano. He knows 8,000 individual classical pieces of piano he can play by heart. He doesn't have to look at music. He said a real pro would never have to look at music. They know it all. And I asked him just out of curiosity, because I had lunch and dinner with him. I said, how many hours on average have you practiced piano since you were a child? And I was expecting three, four, or five, maybe six, 13. Hmm. 13 hours a day for 77, eight years. You would think that would burn you out? No way. He loved the piano. My ship here has four pianos on it. If he was at one and somebody came in and it was distracting, he'd just go to another one. He'd just play the piano. And when you see him perform, you're brought to tears because you're seeing a master at, at work. Mm. So I don't find that that's true. I don't think that you can... And, and what we find is the cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines are only there when we have parasympathetic or sympathetic imbalances. And what, what, those are because of boredom or burnout. So when we're doing something we really love to do, those don't show up. We don't have those inflammatory responses. We don't have the heart effect. Heart's inspired. You're doing what you love to do. It's when you're feeling like I should be doing it. I ought to be doing it. I got to do it. I have to do it. I must do it. It's the got to's, have to's, and must that wear people down and burn them out. Like if you were if you were doing a podcast and interviewing amazing people all day long, you probably wouldn't burn out. You'd be inspired by that. Because And if you're getting paid for it, imagine if you're getting paid really handsomely, more than in, in, in your practice, doing interviews of the most amazing people on the planet. I bet you'd be doing interviews. You'd be talking most of the day. I think that makes sense. Because you love learning. Yes, of course. I love learning. I think that's one of my top values. Yeah, you love learning. I love you learning. love to surround yourself with people that are innovative and creative and with ideas and, and interview them and draw that out of them, sure. Mm -hmm. And anything particularly relating to health because you like serving people with health because you know you can help them. So anything that's learning and particularly around health and maximizing potential or whatever, you'll probably just, you could do that all day long. So whenever you see somebody going through burnout, it's just that somewhere you need to sit back and realize you need to really get back to your authentic self. Otherwise, this is not sustainable. Yes. That's what the body comes and tells. What, what I tell people to do is make a list of everything they do in a day. Hmm. On, on and, and, and if you take a day over the next three months and you put a drone over you and video record everything you do, we're watching you work for three months on camera. And you make a list of every single action you did in those three months by watching the camera and make a list of those. And then we, we go uh, and ask, how much does it produce per hour? Because that's a way of knowing that you're serving other people. And then how much meaning on a one to 10 scale, how much meaning is it? If it's a 10, it's something you love to do. If it's a one, it's something you got to do. One's design, the other one's duty. If you're making, if it's all seven, eight, nine, 10, you're not going to burn out. You can do that all day long. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the fours and threes and twos, you're going to burn out pretty quick because you're going, I don't really want to do this. I feel like I'm stuck having to do this. And anybody goes to work and feels that they have to do something because they got to do it. I guarantee you that language will let you know you're headed for burnout because you're, you feel trapped. You, you got to block your, your, what you want to do is not happening here. Mm -hmm. That's why if you don't prioritize your life and get on with doing what you love and delegating lower priority things, you're headed for burnout and boredom. I don't do anything but teach, research, and write and travel. I delegate everything else. I haven't driven a car since 34 years since I've driven a car. I haven't cooked since I was 24. Anything that's low on my values that somebody has to motivate me or remind me to do, I delegate to specialists who love doing it so that they can do something they're inspired by surround myself with people that know more about it than I do and do a greater job than I do and get on with doing what my core competence is, which is teach, research, and write and share information. I don't get burned out doing that. I don't have anything to burn me out because I love doing what I do. Where do we think about the judgment? You said that judgment is a very, it drains you out, whereas appreciation and love, you know, it uplifts you. Now coming to judgment, how do we become judgment less or is judgment something 
that is ingrained in us it's a way of judging others that something is good or bad and you say that it's somewhere well, we are looking ourselves there judgment comes very commonly from what they call moral hypocrisies moral hypocrisies are fantasy idealisms that people impose society about how their social contracts that usually the oppressor over the oppressed impose on the people uh, it's a way of controlling the people basically it's a guilt producing control business and it's a bunch of ideal fantasies about how life's supposed to be and if and so your your mother gets up and she says now be nice don't be mean be kind don't be cruel be be generous don't be stingy be positive don't be negative be peaceful don't be wrathful and then then she goes and yells at dad and screams at him and does things and it's a moral hypocrisy nobody lives that way it's a fantasy and anytime you compare your life to a fantasy you self defeat but life's not a fantasy life has got two sides i'm not a nice person i'm not a mean person i'm a human being with a set of values if you support my values i can be nice as a pussycat you challenge my values i can be mean as a tiger i'm both i have both sides i don't need to get rid of one side of myself and oh get rid of this and only be this way that creates a moral hypocrisy and then what happens if you indoctrinate yourself with those moral hypocrisies you then judge yourself by them and judge other people by them and you're trapped in them and you're thinking well there should be nice person but they're tough but you need both nice and mean and kind and cruel to grow maximum growth occurs in the border of the pairs of opposites and so you need both to grow you don't grow in one sidedness if somebody supported you all the time you'd be a juvenile dependent if somebody challenged you become more precocious independent entrepreneurs usually come from challenging starts not supportive ones not the easy ones they come from challenges it makes them innovate great have confidence to be on their own so the moral hypocrisies that we get indoctrinated by are part of the reasons we compose uh, you know impose on ourselves and other people these judgments and their ideals and the truth is everything ultimately is on the way not in the way so if you can take something and you you see somebody you they, they do that you don't like and you immediately go point your finger at them how dare they do that and go look at yourself and find out where you do it you got the same behavior and once you level the playing field to see you do it to the same degree as you see in them you stop the judgment once you see the benefit of what they did instead of just assuming it's negative without positive because of the moral injunctions you start to see that this person serves you the guy that's that's challenging is also serving you and once you can see both sides of things simultaneously and own what you see in others the judgments calm down it's just a training it's just learning to ask different questions and not make assumptions on moral hypocrisies not make moral uh, dictates on things that are black and white the people that are most the most stressed are people that have black and white thinking most of the conflicts in the world are because of black and white thinking not gray if you're if you see something positive you fear it's loss if you see something negative you fear it's gain if you see something neutral you don't have you're resilient and adaptable and stress is the inability to adapt to a changing environment so if you're if you're able to adapt and you can see both sides of things where's the stress stress is simply the loss of that which you seek and the the gain of something you're trying to avoid because you're judging it would you also say forgiveness is also too much of a judgment a lack of inability to forgiveness when people judge too much they are not able forgiveness to forgiveness assumes forgiveness assumes that they did something you haven't done forgiveness assumes that it had more negatives than positive benefits and that what that means is you're you're caught in your moral high ground assuming that you didn't get a benefit out of what they did and you can't grow from it and so i think that anything you say your forgiveness i forgive you you're going to keep attracting any saying thing you say i'm sorry about it, you'll keep doing go look at yourself you come you you come home late for work it's a sorry late honey okay i forgive you and then two days later sorry i'm late honey okay i forgive you you both keep doing the same thing you'll keep doing the same thing and she'll keep experiencing and attracting the same thing because they're both moral illusions people live by their values not other people's values they try they they end up defeating themselves so i'm i'm not to uh, I don't like the idea of trying to impose an idea an artificial you know ideal on the people instead of I'd rather find out what their values are and know what to expect. Hmm. You can't be betrayed by somebody if you know what their values are and expect them to live in their values. You can only be betrayed when you expect them to live in yours or expect them to live in some ideals that no human being can live by. Now you're betrayed. So you set up your own stress by these like expectations that are unrealistic.
Doctor, I think this will, you know, I think all the HR companies should have this value system. So this will help the recruitment go way better. I think even in matching in your relationships, this will help. And also finding your jobs, this will help. Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I hire somebody, the first thing I do is do a value determination process. And I ask them a series of questions. Here's the job description one by one and take the job duty. How is doing this going to help you fulfill your top value? If they can't answer it, don't hire them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be engaged. If, if they go, they rattle off with enthusiasm the answer, great. That means they can see how doing that's going to fulfill their life. But if every time you ask them, well, how is doing this going to help them? If they can't answer, there's no fluency and congruency. You're going to be pushing them uphill. You're going to end up having a guy that's or gal that's basically expecting entitlement and they're working and they're not fulfilled. And you set it up because you hired somebody that's not inspired by the job. Don't waste your time on people that don't want to do the work. Find somebody that loves doing what you need done and they'll do it. They'll do a greater job than you will at it. Let's say somebody got into a job which is completely not aligned with their value systems. Now they realize they are staying in that job just because they have they need to have the financial security. And maybe it's not fair. It's not fair to the company. It's not fair to your life. It's not fair to your family. It's not fair to the company. It's not fair to the customer. It's not fair to the stakeholder and the, the, the shareholder because you're going to be not functioning at, you're not going to, you're, you're actually holding back the competitive and comparative advantage of that company. No, I, I went to IBM many years ago. This is quite a ways back. And I got asked to speak at IBM and I walked in the room. There were 400 people from this bill, from this building in Houston, Texas, the main IBM building in Houston. 400 people packed into this room. The regional manager was right in the front row. I come on the stage and I said, how many of you can't wait to get up in the morning and work for one of the greatest companies in the world, IBM? One hand went up, the regional manager, one. He didn't see what was behind him. Nobody there. I hit my microphone. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. How many of you can't wait to get up in the morning and work for one of the greatest companies in the world, IBM? No hands except that one man. But this time he looked around and everybody had their hand up. And I was supposed to speak on a, a, a topic. I stopped. I came down off the little stair step thing. I went down the aisle and I said, I'm changing the name of this talk today. You may not like this. You hired me to do something else, but I see a problem in your company. You got disengaged people that are holding on to a job out of security instead of actually making this company great. So today is poop or get off the pot day. <laughs> so I went in there and I basically laid into everybody. I said, you're holding your life back. You're holding your family back. You're holding your company back. You're not inspired. You're going to affect your health. If you continue to do something, you're not inspired to do. So make a decision today, either get on board and let's get inspired and I showed them ways of doing that, or let's go, get out of here, go and do something you really love to do and quit holding yourself back and living in survival instead of actually inspiration. Well, 400 people, 75 people gave their, their notice that day, quit. <laughs> 75. <laughs> now, the lady that hired me thought she was going to lose her job because of what I said. And she came up to me and she barely wanted to even look at me. And she said, you, of course, you know, I probably lost my job today. I said, good. You're <laughs> part of the problem. You're part of the problem. Because what I said is needed in this company. And I cared about the company more than you do. Because you're just looking for security. I, I kicked the people's butts today. Now, the lady... Didn't even, I was, she was supposed to take me to lunch afterwards. She didn't want to. I had to go to lunch by myself. She was she was afraid of losing her job because I didn't follow the protocol. I said, I wasn't interested in protocols. Interested in what will get the job done. You know, because what you asked me to speak about is not the problem here. You're dodging the issue. And you know it. So I laid into her. So she didn't take me to lunch. I had to get my own transport back <laughs> to my office. And two weeks later, this, this is back in the days when you still got mail. 
This mm -hmm. is before the fax, right at the fax machine days in the early, the mid eighties. Eighties, yeah. And uh, I got a, I got a, a letter from the regional manager IBM, and my secretary heard what happened and she saw the letter and she brought it back to me and she said, "Can I watch you open this? I can't wait to read this." She sat there and she said, "Can I watch?" I said, "Yeah, you watch." Open it up. And in there, it says, Dear Dr. Martini, thank you for what you've done for IBM. We are on fire. We are on the most energy, the most, we're in recruitment mode. We're hiring people that are inspired to be with IBM. We're making sure of that this time. We are on fire. Our business has gone up and you saved us a fortune and outplacement because we were having to let, we we're going to get ready to lay some people off. You just, they walked out and then we didn't have to deal with outplacement, saved us a fortune. And I thought, great, integrity works. The lady came back to me because she was a patient originally. And she came back to me, humble, put her head down and said, will you take me back? I said, of course I will. And she said, I got a promotion for bringing you to IBM. Wow. And I said, I gave her a hug. She gave me a hug. And she said, I was absolutely scared of losing my job. I was absolutely thinking, what am I going to do? I was bitter and angry at you. I was, I, I couldn't sleep that night and the next night. Cause I was thinking about what you said. You're part of the problem. If you're not going to be inspired about this job, I made a decision I really want to be here. It was a huge change in my, my feelings. And I got a promotion because I got part of the, I, I got out of being part of the problem. I got part of the solution and we are on a hiring mode. We're hiring quality people and we're using some of your ideas to make sure we don't get somebody that's not inspired. We're using values to make sure that they're really engaged. Sometimes jumping into the cold water is a good solution. Well, I kicked their butts what I did. <laughs> I figured I got nothing to lose. The worst thing that can happen is they'll go, we won't ask you back. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lack of speaking. I get to speak every day. So I, I'm not going to lose anything because I was, but I was integral. I made sure I said something that I saw was obvious they needed in that company. So if I would have pussyfooted around there and just said something that wasn't meaningful, I wouldn't have had anybody listening to me. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have paid attention. They listened that day. So Dr. When people have this fear, okay, oh my God, I just realized my authentic self is something exactly opposite of what I am forcing myself to do right now. And how am I going to handle myself, you know, pursuing my authentic self? Any tips? Well, on if, you don't, if, you, if you don't start designing your life and laying out a business plan of what you want to do, if it's a business, <clears throat> then you're going to be doing what everybody else tells them. Any area of your life you're not empowered in, people are going to overpower you. If you don't decide what you want in, in your business, somebody else is going to tell you what to do. So if you're in a job that you're not inspired to do, it's because you haven't decided what you want to do and organize a way of serving people with it and making way more money doing your own business. You pay the most taxes working for somebody else. You pay the least taxes if you own your own business. You pay even less, less taxes if you invest. So it's going to just move you over to something that's meaningful. And if you don't have the courage to be an entrepreneur, then then you better appreciate your job. Go find out how your job is helping you do something meaningful. But if you really want to do something else, don't have a fantasy. Design a plan and get after it and take a little action step. It's little baby steps that make big dreams. You move every single day a little step closer towards what you want to do and appreciate the job and ask, how is this job temporarily helping me get there? How is what I'm learning in this job helping me get to my new career? And see it as on the, and, and appreciate it and link it to what you really want to do and design what you want to do and start building a dream of life. Otherwise, your life's going to go by. It goes by quick. Life goes by much quicker. I'm 70. Boom, it goes by like that. It's all of a sudden, you know, it passes by. If you're not, if you have regrets in your life because you didn't take command of your life. Thank you so much, Dr. Martini. I think I'm going to put the your assessments test on how to understand your value system in the show notes so people can do that. And I'm also looking forward to attend one of your breakthrough sessions in the future and looking forward. Thank you so much for the thank time. You. Thank you for having me on your show and thank you for everything. Appreciate it.